Welcome to Our Jewish Roots with insightful Bible teaching from Israel by Dr. Jeffrey Seif. This week, Babylonian invaders are knocking on the door of the southern kingdom of Judah as we continue our series, Kings and Kingdoms. Thank you for joining us today. I'm David Hart. I'm Kirsten Hart. Jeffrey Seif. We're in our series, Kings and Kingdoms. We have we're, a professor here with us at the do, desk. We do, a yes. professor, uh, who's who teaching us so much. But we're at, the, we're at the last two. Yes. This is it. This is it. Oh, my goodness. Well, we have a lot to learn about Josiah and Zedekiah. They're the two kings today, right? Yeah, you're going to like one of them. And what about the other? <laughs> Best not we can so much. Do. Sorry, not so good. They're going to be graded here in a little bit, but right now, let's go to the Kotel in Jerusalem with Dr. Seif's teaching. You can uh, feel the sense of sacred here at the Kotel, right in front of the Western Wall. It's a sacred place for uh, Jewish men. You can see the davening behind me that is religious Jews in a talus, a prayer shawl. Uh, there's a verse in the New Testament about going into a room and shutting the door and seeking the Father. Well, here it's in effect going into a tent, uh, the tallest. It's just the individual and God seeking him out at a place that's particularly sacred here. Uh, the Western Wall is very sacred to Jewish people because it's what's left of the temple complex. In fact, this was the temple in Jesus' day. And given the nature of it all, it's so very special. People come here to pray by the hundreds and thousands, hundreds and thousands and millions, in fact. Not only that, it's not on camera right now. There's a bar mitzvah, a number of them in proximity here where young men come. They're a, a passing puberty, and there's something of a rite of passage in Jewish culture where individuals become, in effect, the son of the commandment. I think it's more of a rite of passage, it's a commitment, it's a celebration of a young boy passing puberty and getting a little older. The extent to which an individual bonds themselves to be a son of the commandment is open to question. I say that because the culture here is more secular on the whole than what most religious would like. And it certainly is true in the Jewish world in America where many people are Jewish in a cultural sense, but not necessarily in a religious sense when it comes to commitment to biblical text. One can live out a cultural kind of religion where God is at a distance and religion's at a distance. This is not only a problem in modernity, it was a problem in antiquity, in Bible days, in fact. And there's a fascinating story about a king who comes to power named Josiah, a king of Judah who comes to power at a time when people have long since forgotten Jehovah's will and ways. But there's something of a discovery. They discover the book. We're going to take a look at a book in a moment and see how that story plays out. This, this wonderful moment in Old Testament history where people who were living in a Jewish commonwealth realized they forgot about the God of Israel and the Word of God from the God of Israel. They opened it up, they rediscovered and made adjustments. We're going to look at that right now. You know, there's, there's a fascinating story in uh, 2 Kings 22 where the, uh, the Hebrew people had forgotten the scriptures, interestingly. And we're told here, I'll read it in the Hebrew, and the, the high priest said to the scribe, Sefer Torah Motsoti Bebet Adonoi. I have found the book of the law. I found the Torah uh, in the house of Adonoi. Ravayitain Hilkaya Ed Hasafar El Shafan Vayik Ra'ehu. And Hilkaya de delivered the book and he read it. It's a fascinating story, it seems to me, where people can be, uh, uh, they can be Jewish, but 
not in touch with the God of the Jewish people or the covenant literature uh, of the Jewish people. And actually, tragically, uh, in looking at uh, uh, the book of what we call Second Kings here, um, it's been such a, a, a bad ride uh, in Judah. I mention that is ever since the Civil War, um, there are uh, 28 kings here. Only eight of them are pious. You know, behind me now, there's, there's piety at play. Uh, individuals who reflect a kind of commitment to the, the, the terms of the covenant, but it had long since been forgotten. Happily, someone rediscovered it, a king. And I think, by the way, that we do better when we have leaders in power that, um, that happen to have something of a love for the Hebrew literature. What happens is this king, his name is Josiah, um, mindful of this discovery, he will, in verse 13, say, go inquire of the Lord for me and for the people of Judah concerning the words of the book that is found. Go talk to the Lord, he, he speaks to the priest, and inquire of him because the book had been read and he realized there were certain punishments that were going to be meted out uh, in Judah because of their perfidy, because of their faithlessness. He says, for great is the wrath of the Lord that is kindled against us because our fathers have not hearkened unto the words of this book to do according to all that is written concerning us. It's just not a problem back here, back then. In America today, in so many ways, people have forsaken uh, the Lord. They've forsaken the literature. Uh, things are at play in culture that are so very bombastic. Uh, what I look for when I cast a vote for a leader, whether it's someone on a city council, whether it's a mayor, whether it's a president, uh, whomever, I want someone who has some commitments to the biblical testimony. The lack thereof breeds bad things, a kind of liberalization. And I believe in being liberal, gracious, free, and open-minded, but we get to a point where people forget the essence and substance of, of, of what it is to be a, a, a righteous people, a just and equitable people. And uh, what we need for sure, uh, in as much as here, back in Josiah's day, the Bible was rediscovered and it was re-employed and decisions were made uh, that comported with biblical sensibilities. Would it be that we had leaders today that acted this way? I think our culture would be the better for it. I asked Baruch Kvasnika, the director of the Jerusalem Seminary, for his perspective on the implications of King Josiah rediscovering God's written word. Baruch, Josiah came into a troubled world and transformed it, correct? It's true. It is such an amazing fact that the Torah scroll was discovered and transformed life in Israel. People, you know, people can be culturally Jewish but not really attached to the literature of the Jewish people or the God of the Jewish people. It's just culture. It was like that back then, wasn't it? It's true. Jewish identity is wrapped up not just in ethnicity, DNA, or the land. It's also wrapped up in the religion and the Torah that he rediscovered. Yes, and in the land, people forgot the Torah outright, which sounds strange, but when Josiah lived and breathed, it was many years before the invention of the printing press. Uh, kings were, were beckoned to manufacture a copy of it, but it had all fallen into disuse for, for decades. True, they discovered a national treasure that was a spiritual treasure that transformed them in ways because they were reading the text and allowing that texts that transform their lives. So what happens in the Bible? They clean house? They cleaned house in a major way. They got rid of idols. They got rid of idolatry. And there was a renewed focus in walking straight in the ways of the Lord. My understanding is the king had the, the scroll read to him and he realizes there's incongruity between what that literature is demanding and the way that he was living and administrating and he decided to fix it and bring himself closer to the biblical narrative. He allowed the word of God to cut his heart and repent. And when that leader repented, Josiah, 
it transformed the people. That can happen today as well. Yes, and I'm interested in the today moment principally because I want to see the Bible make its way into the public arena in American politics, Israeli politics, wherever. I think when, when the Bible comes in, good things happen. Conversely, when it's thrown out, bad things happen. What needs to happen is that the Torah, the Tanakh, the Older Testament, and the New Testament are central to our life, our spiritual life meditating it on day and night, just like Josiah did and Joshua mentions and Saul mentions, meditating on the Torah day and night. Hey, I'm going to vote for politicians that do some of that. Good talking to you today. Thank you. In the previous segment, we looked at Yoshiahu an interesting fellow. The name means God has healed, and indeed there was healing during his administration. Successive kings, however, were worse than those that preceded him, the last of which is one that will be the object of our attention today. In chapter 24, he makes his entrance onto the stage of the biblical drama. His name is, is Zidkiyahu, which means God is just, God is righteous. Righteous justice entailed judgment. It was a horrible picture. And coming to you from this place. You know, I remember there was an old TV show when I was young. It spoke of the agony and the ecstasy. In the previous segment, just in another part of this Western Wall, there's the ecstasy, there's prayer, there's, there's joy. And I can even hear it uh, reverberating in the background now. People come here to celebrate. To, to bless the Lord, to remember his deliverance. The nation state's been delivered. Uh, Jerusalem has been recovered. Young people come here with a dedication ceremony. That's on the other side of the wall, the good news. The bad news is here. And there's vestiges of former destruction. In the days of the Romans, specifically, the stones that were felled in the 70 AD debacle still stand here. Now. I'm interested in another destruction that came in the days of Zedekiah, the last of the Judean kings. It was tragic, I should say. God said at the beginning of it all in Bereshit in Genesis, there was a seminal promise when God said to Avraham, he said, I'm going to make of you a great nation and a great people. Well, we've been following this nation through this series, Kings and Kingdoms, and we've seen the rise and demise, mostly the demise from a united monarchy to a divided monarchy. And now finally, as we're going to see for the moment, the, 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 the throne of Judah is going to be felled. It's going to come to an glorious end when these walls came a-tumbling down. We go from one set of ruins to another. I mentioned that there's Roman ruins over here. These are ruins of a former Arabic conquest. There's been a lot of history in this part of the world. I don't want to talk to you about sticks and bricks. I want to talk to you about what brings about destruction, and that is the word sin. Sin wreaks havoc for individuals. If you have a, a flagrant sinner in a family system, you know, a husband, a spouse, it can bring the system down. And to be sure, if you have bad leadership in government, it brings it down. And speaking of bringing it down, we're looking at a place in scripture where it all came tumbling down. Second Kings chapter 24, we're told, Vayimrod Sidkiyahu Bamelech Bovel. And Zedekiah rebelled against the king of Babylon. He had rebelled against the Lord before that, by the way, as noted. He did evil, Vayas, Arabi, and the Adonai. Uh, it says just before, he did evil in the eyes of the Lord. And not just him, all the kings before him, save for Josiah. With Josiah, whom we spoke of earlier, with his revival, it's been argued, too little too late. Uh, he was able to, to stave off an impending judgment, but owing to the, the wickedness that compounded subsequent to him, 
uh, the nation state fell. It really is quite the tragic story. And it's told in chapter 25 how the Babylonians make their entrance onto the stage. Jerusalem is surrounded. There's a siege. There's a breach. And the net result finally is that some of the soldiers that have survived to this point, along with the royals, they flee. We're told they make their way down to Jordan. God had promised a great nation and a great people, and here what's left of it is running for its life. I mean, it really is quite tragic. And again, bad leadership, bad decision, bad politics, bad consequences. It's like it in the ancient day. It's like that in modernity, which is why we want the right people in the right place, whether it's in your personal house or whether it's in the house of government. At the end of the day, People matter. The values that drive matter. Obedience to God matters. I want to note the tragedy here. It's just so despicable. To me, it's the, it's the ultimate in, in ruin. We're told in, in chapter uh, 25, uh, they slew his sons before his eyes. Now, by the way, I think it's the ultimate insult in life to have to bury your children. I mention this here because the Babylonians, they capture the royal family, and all of the children are murdered in front of Zedekiah's eyes. I would rather die than have to see that. But death didn't come to him immediately after that. To add insult to the injury, we're told in the text, <laughs> that is, they put out Zedekiah's eyes. In other words, the last thing he saw was the murder of his family. I would rather die after that. I'd rather die before that. But no, they cut his eyes out instead. And then we read in the text, and I'm looking in verse 7, then they take him off to Babylonia in chains in a dungeon. What an inglorious end for a line that was promised a glorious future in the beginning. Sin ruins. We need the right people in the right place, and we need to exercise our influence to endeavor to get the right people with the right vision, with the right values, in the right place. As a parent, my kids bring along suitors. I look deeply like an eagle looking through tall grass, looking for a gopher as they're flying over. There's penetrating insight into the depth. I want to know who is this person? Do they have the kind of values, the kind of virtues that I lead to success in life? I want it at that level. I, as an individual, want to live with the right vision, the right values that lead to success in life. I want it in my home. I want it in my congregation. I want it in my ministry. And I want it in my country. Whether I'm voting for city council, for a mayor, for a president, whatever it is, these rotations come along all the time. And in a democracy, I have an opportunity to exercise influence. Oh, people say that religion has no business in the public square. We should separate religion from state, church and state. I believe that's a myth. Certainly, anyway, those of us with biblical value, want to use those values and use our influence to endeavor to ensure that they are inculcated into culture. This, I believe, is a recipe for success in life. And coming to you from the ruins of a bygone era, I want to remind you that the lack thereof leads to ruin. Our resource this week, the series Kings and Kingdoms, these eight programs examine the rulers of ancient Israel and Judah because within their stories we find lessons of godly leadership and principles we can observe today, even in our political leaders. Get this series for yourself or to share with friends by contacting us and asking for the DVD series, Kings and Kingdoms. If you only watch us on television, you are missing additional content available only on our social media sites, Facebook, YouTube and Twitter. You can always visit our website, which is home base for all of our ministry activities and information.
There you can sign up for our free monthly newsletter, watch the TV program, or visit the online store. You can sign up for a tour of Israel and Petra, or a cruise to Greece and Ephesus. Please contact us for more information. We have so much information on our website for you. All you have to do is click on levitt.com, find some past programs that maybe you missed, find a friend, and maybe they would want to see a past program, just go to levitt.com. That's our home base for everything Our Jewish Roots. Yes. And Our Jewish Roots also go all the way back to King David. We've been talking about the kings. King David was known as a man after God's own heart, well, Sarah Lieberman is a woman after God's own heart. Yes. She has a heart for praise and worship, and she now will give us a Hebrew word for worship, exalt. Shalom, chaverim. Welcome back to our series, Exploring the Words for Worship in Hebrew. I am so excited because as a worship leader, I know that when you explore the Hebrew language in connection with these two words, praise and worship, you find so much more. And as we appropriate this into our worship lives and our regular lives, it transforms us and changes our lives. Now today's word is a special one. It is this word, leshabach. It comes from the root word shavach. And there really isn't a good translation into English, and I'll tell you why. It kind of means to exalt or to describe a nature of something that is supreme or excellent or perfect. It's kind of like when you have regular wine, like in the miracle of Cana, but then when Yeshua turns the water into wine, it is excellent wine. It is the best wine kind of like you have different grades of chocolate or, or olive oil, for example. So when this word leshabach comes in the Bible, it is always in the context of describing God as supreme or so much greater, so much more wonderful than anything that we could ever imagine. This verse that you're used to hearing that says, because your loving kindness is better than life, my lips will praise you. Well, in Hebrew, it says that because your loving kindness is better than life, my lips will leshabach, which means they will describe you as so much greater, so much more exalted, so much more wonderful. And I wonder if in our worship experience, we could think about that. How can we ascribe to the Lord His excellence, His perfection, His beauty, as you go forward in your worship services, I hope that you will remember this word, le shabach. It says that all the nations are going to come together and exalt God, that they will ascribe to Him this wonderful praise and worship.
the God of the Bible is truly worthy of all of our praise. That was beautiful, wonderful music from our founder, Zola Levitt. We're here today talking about a king, and I think we have a report card here. What yes. does he get? Yeah, I think it's a good one. You know, he's hoping. not Jesus, he's not Yeshua, but I'm going to give him some praise. He's my only A, wow. and I'll tell you. Well, except for, the, except for the boss. Right. He gets uh, an A plus, Yeshua, though, right? Yeshua, he yes. gets an A plus plus. plus. <laughs> but what I like about him, and I wish it for all of our leaders, is he discovered the Bible and decided to apply it to his vocation. And the world was a better place by virtue of his so doing. Would that I saw more of that. Uh, that's what I'm looking for in leaders. Well, I'm just surprised that this king, a, a king of Judah, I mean, the temple's right there, is Jerusalem, that when he became king, and I know he was eight, he was very, very young, but that someone didn't say, here are the scriptures, this is what you need to learn, yeah. because you're ruling people that believe in this. Right. I mean, that on his own, he just happened to no, find it, go, what are no, these? No, workers discovered it and brought it to yeah. him, it was found. Uh, and it was found and taken seriously. Of course, we're living many years before the printing press, uh, but kings were supposed to know the word and make a right. copy of it. But that had fallen into disuse. Even in public discourse today, people can talk about religion and Judeo-Christian ethics, but not go to the primary source. I'm looking for leaders that want to go to the source and apply it to circumstances that they deal with. Right. Uh, this one gets an F. You know, I hate to end it on a bad note when I'm looking at these kings. He's the last but, one. But he was the king of the end right. uh, of Judah. A, a horrible end to this man, his life, his family. There was a lot, of sin, what it is. a lot of sin going on during this time. Oh, to be sure, yes. And it leaves a mark and it brings nations to ruin. Again, another reason why I want leaders that want to apply biblical principles to the kind of decisions that they make and the way that they live. I don't expect perfection. I do out of Yeshua, Jesus, the ultimate King of Kings, but I want leaders to be more like this one right here, we do too. Josiah. Josiah was a good leader, and we desire to be a leader in Christian television, specifically bringing the good news through the eyes of the Jews that is only possible through your help. So we thank you thank for that. You. I want to thank you. Do stay with us, support us, and let's do it again next week. Till then. Sha'alu Shalom Yerushalayim. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. Join us right now for additional content that is only available on our social media sites, Facebook, YouTube, and Twitter. Visit our website, levitt.com, for the current and past programs, the television schedule, tour information, and our free monthly newsletter, which is full of insightful articles and news commentary. View it online, or we can ship it directly to your mailbox every month. Also on our website is the online store. There, you can order this week's resource, or you can always give us a call at 1-800-WONDERS. Your donations to our Jewish roots help us to support these organizations as they bless Israel. Please remember we depend on tax-deductible donations from viewers like you. This has been a paid program brought to you by Zola Levitt Ministries.